Chapter 1 Temperance Dancing Lights from a passing car raked over the dirty windows before the black night swallowed them again. Music from some drunken revelry provided a booming bass and burst of shouted lyrics as the wind shifted and turned. Every now and again, gunshot. Whether celebratory or offensive, there was no way to know. But Lorelai didn't really care, either. She slid up the stranger's body, running teeth, lips, and tongue over the ridge of her hips, the curve of her stomach and ribs, lingering along the swell of her breasts. The woman's pale skin was damp and salty with sweat, her body ragged and limp beneath Lorelai. Have you had enough, darling? Lorelai purred. The woman just blinked, her mouth moving wordlessly. A feral grin tugging at Lorelai's lips as she slid further up, leaning over the woman's face. She'd never known her name, just picked her up at a gay bar a few blocks away. The woman had been lonely and receptive, not looking for commitment or conversation. So perfect. The stranger breathed heavily, her pupils dilated into blindness. She trembled as Lorelai gently kissed her cheek. You've been delicious, Lorelai murmured, but now you can rest. Lorelai kissed her lips then, and the scent of flame and sulfur filled the air. A final cascade of heat and energy flooded through Lorelai, sliding down her throat like rich wine. The woman bucked once beneath her, then went still, collapsing back a last time. Lorelai sat up and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand, her lips still tingling as she climbed off the hotel bed, her bare feet meeting the cheap, worn carpet. She had just started a shower when her phone went off. She pulled it out of her black leather purse, glanced at the screen, and scoffed. Her mother could wait. She tapped, dismiss. The bathroom mirror was already clouded with steam, the ripped vinyl floor and ugly yellow paint slick with condensation. Lorelai glowered, her lips curled in distaste. City hotels were plentiful, so useful, but truly not her style. She stood beneath the hot rain of the shower, running her hands through her long mahogany hair, cleaning her victim's scent from her skin. Her fingers were exceptionally smooth, devoid of fingerprints. It was best not to leave marks. Her phone rang and she scowled, turning off the shower. No peace for the wicked. Drying off, she dressed again in her little black dress and heels. Such mundane tasks, all of this. Just survival. A girl has to do what a girl... A ping now. A text. She opened the message, expecting an angry tirade from her mother for ignoring her calls. But the message was just a link. She touched it and a map opened, directing her to a club two states away. So like you, she muttered aloud. Her mother sent her all over the place at a moment's notice, like her personal dark harbinger messenger girl. No respect for Lorelai's schedule or... A lesbian strip club? Lorelai's sculpted eyebrows shot up as she read the description. She'd never known such a place existed. A grin tugged at her lips. Arguing with her mother was always futile anyway, and a road trip meant exposure to new cuisine. She moved quickly now, tying up loose ends, but her mind was already miles away. She dropped an open bottle of pills on the bed, scattering a few next to the woman's cupped hand. She looked so peaceful but there was no time to relish and relive the night. The open road called. By late tomorrow night, she'd be hungry again and walking into a two-year-old, five-star establishment. There'd be the crowd and the dancers, all sweet and ripe and trusting in their own element. Goodbye, seedy hotels. Hello, Club Rook. The sun rose and color slowly returned to the world, creeping back tentatively, afraid the night might change its mind and swallow color whole. The black water of the harbor turned deep green, glided with silver crest in the wind. The black streets became tideline running along the waterfront and rook one block up in parallel. They were no longer satin ribbons lacing danger between the warehouses, niche shops, and tenements. But the black blood splattered in blowback across Echo Abage's black skin stayed black. Demon blood was often the color of tar, 
primordial sludge so thick and adhesive, Echo often used muriatic acid to remove it. Dawn was taking back the recovering city far faster than any monster hunter could, and Echo walked faster, the rubber soles of her combat boots silent as she crossed the parking structure's open roof. The view was urban arcane, the pale colors making the run-down, multi-zone neighborhood into something it wasn't, something welcoming, something safe. Echo struck a bundle of wooden matches on a cracked church harrier and threw them back the way she'd come, the gore and remains caught like gasoline with a monstrous gasp of oxygen. Oily stench rose into the cold air and was ripped apart by hungry fingers off the water. In four, three, two, heartbeats. The evidence was gone. Echo vaulted over the ramp railing and dropped through the ivy and morning glories to the next floor. The short sword across her back slapped against her leather jacket with a sticky suck and smack. Aftermath cleanup was always a bitch. The parking garage was three floors above the ground and three beneath. Abandoned eight months ago after the attendant was found half-eaten, the owner had wrapped the perimeter in chain link and barbed wire then slapped up for boarding signs like no trespassing, danger, and keep out. Of course, that made the park irresistible to punks, skaters, druggies, and artists. Beneath the crumbling concrete and crawling vines, the above-ground floors were tattooed with graffiti illustrating Dante's hell, while the subterranean levels probably were. No one really ventured into the half-flooded bowels of the park, unless they were hunting demons. But even demon hunters have to have a day job. Echo slid quickly through the concrete jungle, trying to outrace the day. Though most of the dancers didn't arrive until the night shift, lately she was opening the club at noon. She needed to make sure she didn't smell like brimstone when she was pouring dry martinis to the rich, retired women stuffing tens and twenties into her dancers' thongs. The trick wasn't avoiding staff arriving at the club, but rather avoiding the gazes of early risers in the apartment building next door. Echo rented every floor but her own to club employees. Isis, the DJ, Tony and Syl, the bouncers, the four barbacks who split their rent, Bet, the head of security with her wife and two-year-old twins. Six of the dancers and their assorted spouses and children. Then there was Heather, the club's resident. Well, Heather also composed music for the dancers. Not that Echo took issue with the sex trade. About half the dancers took customers into the private rooms on the second floor. No, Echo's issues with Heather had nothing to do with Heather's profession. In truth, they had nothing to do with Echo, either. Echo dropped down beside the chain-link fence, then leapt up at it, skimming over the rusty barbed wire and disappearing between the park and the condemned warehouse next to it. She slunk through the last shadows, doubling back in the wrong direction more than two blocks, moving as swiftly as the hunter she was. Sandwiched between an empty lot and a state-subsidized halfway house, Echo crossed when she came to Shanti's secret, an arcane apothecary wrapped in a green haven of gardens. The proprietor was an ally, an elemental witch, and a friend. The wards around the shop buzzed like warm, static electricity along Echo's skin. The wards around the club always prickled, cold, and biting. Moments later, day had arrived in full force, the neighborhood a study in stains and concrete, brick and steel. But Echo was inside, her apartment door bolted and chained behind her, the shower hotter than it needed to be. I won't think of her. Echo scrubbed her lean, dark body, her eyes squeezed shut against more than the spray and steam. Think of something else. Think of... Temperance, the newest dancer. A safe topic for wandering thoughts and a good match for a hot shower. At 23, Echo's junior by nine years, Temperance was a Latina and something else. Long and bronze and able to exude a sexually liberated innocence impossible to find in nature. She had never danced before, but had proven so damn good for business that Echo often paused just to pat herself on the back for making an exception to her own experience-required rule. Echo killed the water and walked nude through her apartment. Sounds of mourning in the city drifted through the vents and in the open windows children laughing, cars hooking, grandmothers calling to each other, lovers in a rush. 
Echo had grown up behind a long green lawn and a gated drive. She hadn't known she'd hated it until she left for a working class college 2,000 miles away. She cleaned her sword with anointed oil and salt from the Red Sea, then rubbed down the sheath and belt. Still undressed in reverence for the tools of her trade, she turned next to her leather jacket and chaps, then last to her boots. Luckily, the oil and salt did the trick, and she didn't have to uncap the acid. Hanging her gear in the recessed cabinet, she rolled the bookcase over the opening, the heavy shelves sliding silently on the inlaid track. Then Echo just stood, frozen. Her eyes rested on the leather spines of her parents' books. Moby Dick, Great Expectations, Roots, all side by side with her own. Dante's Inferno, Modern Witchcraft, The Art of War. One world sealed away, another world awaited. Day shift gave way to night shift and the faces of the customers changed. Half the age, half the income, but the nighttime masses were their lifeblood. Bring on the fruity strong drinks. Bring on the rain of dollar bills tumbling over the tip rail. Echo met eyes with Isis. Pinned to the wall in the pexiglass audio-visual booth, Isis, with her milk chocolate skin and Grace Jones hair, resembled an exotic creature drenched in garnet blood-red jewelry, pumping music and color across the dance floor, the tables, the VIP balcony, and, of course, the stage. Isis could expertly isolate sounds to create pockets of ambiance. She was the heartbeat of the club, and Echo was the brain. Isis nodded once at Echo's silent cue and triggered the speakers to pivot, the music to shift. The night's first routine was minutes away, time to build anticipation. Echo nodded at half a dozen customers mouthing drink orders. She poured, stirred, and slid drinks down the long, gold-lit bar or handed them off on packed trays to her barbacks. She returned grins and knowing nods, silent but friendly, firm but fair to customers, and staff alike. Everyone knew Echo, not Echo the demon hunter. Echo the stoic, butch bartender. Brave Echo, damaged Echo. Bachelor by choice, orphan by fate. Sole survivor. For these 10 hours a day, she was only Echo Abage, owner of Club Rook. Temperance Ruiz could feel the bum of the bass like an earthquake, pounding against her back, her bones vibrating with rhythm. She closed her eyes and arched her back like water pouring, her head touching the stage. Her loose chocolate brown curls cascaded over her golden shoulders and pooled around her. She rolled her chest and hips in time to the music, her hands skimming across the stage and through her hair, her heels making lazy circles. The dim lighting of the club warmed the curves of her nearly naked body like kisses of sunlight. Time stood still, her world nothing but beat and movement. These were the moments she lived for, the inner peace that settled around her during a dance. About a song and a half into her three-song set, it would carry her to a place of calm and confidence. When she was wearing nothing but bikini bottoms and heels, her hair loose, her skin flush. When she could lose herself, only then could she forget the hot buzz of being watched. It had only been four months. Would she ever get used to it? Timbrance didn't mind being watched. She even got a thrill from it. But she didn't fully understand it. She wasn't the strongest or the most attractive, certainly. There were half a dozen other dancers at the club who regularly out-tricked and out-danced her. Yet every night there seemed to be a few more people sitting at her stage, a few more people asking for her by name. She tried not to question it. A dollar was a dollar, after all. She slid her arms together, using the force of the movement to slowly rise into a seated position without losing the arch of her back. She glanced over her shoulder as if waking from a long rest, blinking at the light. She locked eyes with a handful of regulars in turn and smiled, holding each gaze for a couple moves. A sprinkle of dollar bills littered the stage, Two of her fellow dancers strutted between the tip railing and the stage, gathering most of her tips into silver, bedazzled tens to keep her hands free from hazards, leaving temperance just enough bills to play with. She stretched forward like a cat, easing the tension in her muscles. She crawled to the edge of her stage, low to the floor, sliding on her forearms as she gathered up the remaining money, 
slipping the bills into the band of her bikini bottom. Feigning shyness, then, she grinned and her eyes found echoes for just a moment. Echo watched intently from behind the bar, her lips tugged into an amused grin. Temperance blew Echo a kiss over her arm, and Echo shook her head as chuckles rippled among the crowd. Stoic Echo was a no-nonsense club owner. She was never seen fraternizing with her dancers. Temperance rose all the way to her feet, arms aloft as her music ended and a few more tips fluttered to the stage. Her helpers chased them down as she walked away, clearing the stage for the next performer. Backstage, Scarlet held out a silk robe and Temperance pulled it over her shoulders. Good haul. The crook gets more popular every day. The rook has been popular for two years, Scarlet grinned. You're just drawing a crowd now. Scarlet rolled her shoulders, preparing for her own set, the light spilling through the curtains playing across the flowering vine tattoos that ran over her shoulders and Temperance was breathless with desire as they parted. Shift dancers. Temperance smiled. It's been a while since you were here after dark. Josh is at a friend's house tonight, Scarlet's face lit. He's starting middle school soon. Can you believe it? All honors classes. He must be a smart kid. Temperance squeezed Scarlet's hand and the other dancer returned the gesture. He is, and so kind. Best thing I ever did. Temperance's helpers joined them backstage and handed her the tip tins. She pulled a handful of bills out for each of them before they sidled away, caught up in their own conversation. Everyone here appreciates you, Temperance, Scarlet assured her. Temperance smiled again and shrugged. I try to be fair. Then Scarlet's music began and the other woman melted onto the stage. Temperance made her way to the busy dressing room, a large open space lined with lockers and filled with rows of vanities. The room was full as shifts switched, some dancers leaving for the day and others preparing to work the night shift. Temperance sat at her space in the back of the room and opened the small safe built into the base of her vanity. Good crowd? Roxy pulled on her black leather thigh-high boots. Temperance admired the lean muscle of Roxy's legs, glowing mocha brown in the vanity's lights. Roxy's short, voluminous curls fell around her face as she bent, trying to ease the zipper the rest of the way over her thigh-high. The soft line of Roxy's silk thong was arresting. Hmm? Roxy chuckled and looked up at Temperance through her eyelashes, as if she knew exactly what Temperance was thinking. I asked, good crowd? Oh, yeah. Temperance had the grace to blush. Better every night. Roxy winked. I've been hearing good things about you. Scarlet said something like that, too. You're both too good to me. We're honest, Temperance. I'm glad Echo made you advocate. We all trust you. Temperance turned to her mirror, pretending to focus on touching up her makeup. The promotion had come as a surprise, only a month after she was hired. At first, she thought the other dancers were teasing her when they'd asked her to take the job as the official go-between between the performers and Echo. You should have been advocate, Temperance murmured. Everyone looks up to you. Roxy chuckled and tossed her hair. I don't plan on being here forever. First record deal or tour I can scrape together and I'm gone. But you like being here. You're more stable. Temperance couldn't imagine Club Rook without Roxy, but she knew Roxy's real passion was music. You are a great singer. Temperance deflected the conversation away from herself. Roxy grinned and ran her hands over Temperance's shoulders, kneading her muscles. Charmer. Roxy, you have my brush. Roxy looked over annoyed. Why would I take anything off your vanity, Destiny? But she sighed anyway and walked away to deal with the other dancer. Temperance stood, tightening the tie of her robe. Did Roxy think of her as a potential lover or a kid's sister? Ugh, the backstage drama. With a soft smile, Temperance walked toward the back door. The L-shaped alley ran behind the rook, then up one side between the club and the apartment building next door that Echo also owned. Several of the dancers lived there, including Temperance. Club security, Bet, who worked the door, and Tony and Sill, who kept the customers in line once they were inside, never let anyone wander down the alley past the club's entrance, and Temperance always felt safe out there. You okay? Temperance jumped despite herself, but calmed as she spotted Heather O'Neill leaning against the club. 
Heather worked out of the Rook, but not as a dancer. Roxy had told Temperance that Heather catered to only specific niche clients, so there was no conflict of interest or competition among the more eclectic dancers. Temperance had only seen Heather a couple of times. She was always discreet and low profile. You know I respect the hell out of you girls. Temperance realized she was staring. Oh? She recovered without too much grace. Takes guts to do what you do, Heather continued. Dance naked in front of a crowd of strangers. It's vulnerable. Temperance shrugged. You get used to it. Sometimes you even like it. Easy for you to say. Heather checked her watch and looked down the alley for her late client, perhaps. You're sexy as fuck on that stage. Temperance grinned at the crass compliment. You've seen me dance? Heather grinned back. I've seen all of you dance. Ah, ladies, lady, Temperance joked lightly. Heather chuckled and nodded. Some of the Rook performers look like acrobats, others like dancers. A lot of them use the stage to collect clients for the private rooms. But you? Sexy and smooth, natural. You like being on stage whether people look at you or not. Heather's smile was easy. I like what I see. Temperance glanced away. Heather was so bold, but she was also totally relaxed, almost detached. You're a musician. I heard Echo hired you to compose music for the featured dances. I danced to Anruka Yusmota tonight. Heather's green eyes lit with genuine delight. She leaned forward with interest. You know what that means, Anureki Yusmota? Temperance had the grace to blush. I think it's Sanskrit. Heather smiled. Yeah. Spoken Sanskrit. It means passion protected by you. Oh. Temperance was impressed. She looked at Heather and found the musician was still watching her intently. I've heard some of your harp songs, too. You move between EDM and Old World really well. Thank you. Emboldened by Heather's obvious pleasure, Temperance hazarded. Do you take requests? Heather smiled deepened and she nodded once just a bob of her head. I'd compose for you. We should talk about what you'd like. Please. I live next door, eighth floor. I'm on the 10th. The penthouse? A fixer-upper? Yeah. The moment stretched into silence, comfortable and warm. Temperance realized she'd miss this, the one-on-one -on -one connection that wasn't sexual, like the happiness she'd felt with her nana before the heart attack. I heard you were really tough, but you're actually sweet. Temperance said the words before she could stop herself. Heather laughed loud and echoing in the alley. She dug her hands into the pockets of her loose men's jeans. Don't give away my secret now. Temperance grinned. I promise. Heather leaned forward and kissed her cheek. I trust you. Then she was gone, striding up the alley around the corner and out of sight. Temperance stood blinking for a moment, then let herself collapse back against the club wall. Well, maybe the connection wasn't entirely non-sexual after all. Laughing, she went back inside. Heather O'Neill tingled as the pulse of the music raced along her skin. Shadows danced in the corners of the club, a radiant atmosphere of beautiful women and kinetic energy. All eyes were on the stage, including hers. It never ceased to give her a thrill, her music in living, breathing color, rolling their hips as if they had sets of muscles no one else possessed, curling like living vines or springs around the high silver poles. The dancers worked every routine hard. Tonight, alto harp sounds melded with synth electronica laid over a percussive beat, all given life from the deepest parts of her. It was good, and this song wasn't even her best work. It was one of her earliest EDM pieces, but it ratched up the sexual tension just fine. That's what Echo paid her for. And sometimes, when the tips were especially good during a routine she'd composed the music for, the dancers gave her a kickback too. That was Club Rook. Special arrangements, unique circumstances. Nothing was what it seemed. Evocative, mysterious. Heather liked it that way. None of these dancers took the stage because they needed the money. They danced for the love of the dance. The same with the private rooms upstairs. It was never about the money. At first glance, 
The Rook might be mistaken as an exotic club, maybe even just a strip club that catered to the lesbian crowd, but that impression would shatter soon enough. This was the birthplace of sensuality. This was heaven for dreamers and dancers alike. The Rook always gave you more than you expected. Living on the street for most of her teens had taught Heather to roll with anything and everything. Some crazy shit happened almost every night, but she'd always lived for the rush. It amazed her, really, how far she'd come. Street hooker to sought-after musician and debonair dyke with harness for hire. Her lips quirked up in a smile. Her other agreement with Echo was clear. She could use a private room here at the Rook, upstairs with the dancers' rooms but Heather could only cater to specific clients. Straight women, gay men. Clients that didn't take customers away from those select dancers who offered a little extra on the side. Heather shifted. Tonight, like usual, she was packing. Pulling out her phone, she ran her finger along the touchscreen, frowning. Nothing yet. Where are you, sweetheart? Her client was late. She'd grown tired of waiting outside. They were instructed to text an identifier. That was all she needed. Then she'd meet the client at the front door. No questions asked. No conversation. When they reached her private room, the fun would begin. Lord fucking help a client if they decided not to show. Heather always got a credit card when the appointment was made, and no one had contested a charge yet. The text would tell her what the client wanted. Schoolgirl fantasy? Code word ruler. A little BDSM, red. Spanking, pink. It was very easy. There were combinations, but she felt it best to stick with a simple list and progress naturally from there. It was a game to find out if the client really knew what he or she was asking for, to ferret out their dirty little secrets and leave them begging her for more. They always came back. Always. It wasn't so different from composing music. Moving through the sea of hungry-eyed women, Heather let her gaze wander to the open floor. Temperance Ruiz, the newest dancer, was sexy as hell with her caramel skin, long, dark hair, and anime-wide eyes, and they had clearly exchanged some sparks out in the alley. Heather spotted her now, back inside and dressed to work the room, in short shorts, a tight crop top and heels, all white. Heather let her eyes linger. The other dancers liked Temperance, and she could capture the audience's attention like no one else right now. Completely at home in her skin, the girl loved to be watched. But aren't you freezing? Innocence. Quite the winning contrast. Beads jangled and clicked together as Heather meandered the obstacle course of hurried barmaids and overeager clubgoers. Passing the- Your skin is like ice. Her long red hair was bound in a mixture of tiny braids and dreads. Tonight, it was swept up from her neck in a stunning updo. Fucking cool is what it was. Took her hours, but the effect was worth it. Copper wire, smoky red beads, and gray stones wove through the elaborate mass, draping artfully down the side of her face. Her new red leather bustier bound her breast tightly beneath the gray. You have to come tonight, Clique Mao. Fiction for the client. Loose-fitting jeans draped over her high-heeled black leather boots. The heels gave her the height she needed for the evening. The music changed to one of her newer compositions, and Heather grinned. A dancer, Bubblegum, took the stage, breast already free, silver fairy wings on her I'm going to spike the rook. Long blonde hair streaked with iridescent pink, Bubblegum sported a G-string to match, and as she moved to the bass line, her ivory flesh undulated in perfect sync to the beat. She was as fluid as water, and Heather paused just to watch. Every flex of Bubblegum's muscles as she curled and pulled around the pole gave a new flash of skin and muscle. It was poetry. Good song. Heather turned to find Echo standing next to her. Echo's dark eyes missed nothing, and for a heartbeat, Heather was reminded of Eddie. It had been three years, but it didn't take away the hurt. Being around Echo only reminded Heather of what she'd lost. If Echo had just been Eddie's sister, it would have been one thing. But no. It just kicked Heather in the head every time. Thanks. It's a play on nitrous oxide. For her phone again. 
Still nothing. But with a little more dinner may. I'm charging her fucking card double. Client late. Brushing her hands down the front of her. Ah, uh, power, strength. Nodded, her mocha features settling into what passed for her smile. You have the new songs? Yeah. Heather slid a drive from the pocket of her jeans into Echo's waiting hands. Three. Should have two more in a couple days. Busy week. Echo's glance slid away to the front door. I think that one's yours. Heather snorted, taking in the timid-looking 30-something white woman who stood just- Filins from the claws of a loop guru. Its phone vibrated against her hip, and she scowled. The woman was pretty in a vanilla sort of way, black slacks and an expensive silk shirt. Her dark hair was cut in a fashionable bob. Tony, one of the bouncers, said something to the newcomer, pointing in Heather's direction. Heather raised her chin in acknowledgement. Have fun, Echo said over her shoulder as she moved back behind the bar. Heather glanced down at her phone. Red. Very well, then. Striding toward the woman, Heather put on her fiercest smile. Push she glanced at Lily. And don't you dare make an it's all Greek to me joke. Heather stepped in front of the kneeling woman. Jenny. Not her real name. Not th You made that joke yesterday and the day before. Heather suggestively stroked the realistic dildo jutting from her black leather harness. She watched Jenny watch the movement and grinned. As soon as they'd reached Heather's room, Jenny had automatically undressed and assumed a submissive position. This had earned her points. You have good form, Jenny. I like that. The flogger in Heather's hand whooshed as she moved it through the air. You'll call me master tonight. Is that understood? Yes. Thank you, master. Bright blue eyes peered up at Heather through soot black lashes. Lips parted in desire. I could, if I used too much, which I'm not. Her nipples, they're very carefully calculated in accordance to the volume of the rook and the number of customers expected. Of her dildo just out of reach of Jenny's lips. What do you think I should do? I wouldn't if I weren't sure. You know that. Relationship. She made to move past Jenny, but instead grabbed a fistful of Jenny's hair and pulled her head backward. <laughs> Jenny scrambled to maintain her balance. No, I'm sorry. Her voice rose, eyes wide with shock. I don't think you're sorry at all, Heather whispered, running the tip of the flogger along Jenny's cheek. Up. I want you stretched across the bed. You owe me. Jenny scrambled to right herself, a blur of flesh as she climbed onto the crimson bedding. Her pear-shaped ass gleamed in the warm lights of the room. I don't think I'm going to use my flogger. Yet. You don't deserve it. Heather laid the flogger on the dresser, instead picking up a wooden paddle. A little girl spanking for a little girl who needs to learn to tell time. Yes, mistress. I don't want to talk to you again about this. Is that understood? Yes. Jenny's voice quavered. Count with me. Yes, master. Heather raised her arm, the paddle whistling through the air as it came down, connecting with first one ass cheek and then the other. Thwack. Thwack, thwack. Oh. Jenny squirmed, surprised tears spilling from her eyes. One, two, no, three, master. Again. Heather raised the paddle, her quick strokes warming Jenny's flesh into a beautiful pink blush. Thwack, thwack, smack. Oh my God, that really hurts. Jenny's voice broke, tears falling in earnest now. Four, five, six. Master, I'm sorry I was late. I'll do better, I promise. Her dark hair fell forward, covering her face. Heather's lips curved into a smile. Yes, just like that. Putty in my hands. Her palms smoothed over the sensitive skin of Jenny's ass. Good girl. That's just what I wanted to hear. Now. Are you ready for your reward for taking your punishment so well? I think so. Excellent. Now climb down and bend over the bed. Let's see that shiny pink ass. 
It's mine, and I want to stroke it while I fuck that pretty pussy that's been winking at me all night. Yes, master, Ginny grimaced, breathless, but did as Heather bade her. Opening her legs, she bent forward. Spread them wider, Heather barked, slapping Ginny's leg. Ginny complied, her shimmering pink folds now fully visible to Heather's hungry gaze. Heather trailed her fingers down the lines of Ginny's back, then fanned out across the smooth landscape of her rounded buttocks. Sliding between her thighs, Heather coaxed her nether lips apart, slipping a finger inside. Ginny gasped, arching her hips. Good girl. Heather teased the head of her cock against Ginny's opening. The harness had become part of her a long time ago. Reaching around Ginny, she positioned her hand to work Ginny's clit. I'm going to take you like the little bitch you are. Then next week, when you come through my door, you better fucking be on time. Yes, master. Yes. <gasps> Ginny's voice hitched as Heather thrust inside of her, filling Ginny up even as Heather's fingers tormented her. Heather was certain Ginny would never be late again. Shanti Jossie gazed out the open window into the street beyond. White fairy lights twinkled in the small garden in front of her shop, providing an air of mystery and sophistication. Wrapped lovingly around trees and wound through bushes, the festive lights covered plants surrounding a shallow water sculpture. A talisman of sorts, the mermaid fountain burbled and churned, calling all who were meant to come to Shanti's secret. It was the recessed store behind the garden that first attracted her to the site, an alcove well suited to her purposes. It allowed her to place an extra protection at the front door, hidden in plain sight. She could also see before she was seen, handy in her business. Shanti's dark eyes searched the twilight shadows. Something was stirring. The wards protecting the shop were disguised as solar lights. She renewed them each month to keep them strong, even as the daily dose of energy from the sun gave them power to repel the ever-present darkness that threatened her peace. But those were the risk of this part of the city. So close to Club Rook, Spirits could be a psychic medium's best friend or worst enemy. Tonight, it was proving to be the latter. She slammed her mental door shut against the spirits, demanding her attention with a quick incantation, and found herself wandering toward the French doors leading out back to her private garden. She looked out in silence, not sure what she was looking for. Out back, she kept the plants she used to do her work. Only she was allowed. It was a rule she insisted upon. The soft blue lights that formed a pentagram in the earth created an otherworldly glow to the walled space. Something niggled at her. Smoothing her hands down her loose blue tunic and light gray linen pants, Shanti struggled to calm her restlessness. She tucked a loose strand of her long raven black hair behind her ear and deftly swept the mass up into a clip that had begun to slip. Not the dainty woman her mother was. She took after her father's family. Diminutive she was not, and she lived fully in her body, with her rounded belly and full breasts. All of her 52 years, she had been reminded of what made her different. Witch, lesbian, heretic, seer of worlds that were not her own. She was destined to walk a less traveled path, but the road was long and winding, and had ever so much more to give than what would have awaited her if she had followed the dictates of her family's whims. No, she was her own woman and proud. There was no denying the visions, and they led her here to the people who needed her most. The goddess worked in mysterious ways indeed. The bells wound around her ankles tinkled as she took a step closer to the French doors. Silent twilight, harmless. No, not tonight. Even the soothing hollow sound of Native American flute playing from the CD player did nothing to ease her tension. Her small chihuahua mix Nani whined at her feet, and she reached down to pat his smooth black head. He was a gift from the goddess, and she had learned to listen to his counsel. His deep eyes held secrets she would never completely unravel. What do you see, my love? Shanti reached down and picked up her little man, cradling his small form in her arms. His wide brown eyes met hers, and she smiled, placing a kiss on his nose. I feel it too. Something is in the air tonight. Tucking his warmth against her chest, 
She turned from the window and surveyed the small world of her shop. When's your next appointment? Brianna, Shanti's assistant, came into the room carrying a new batch of lavender scrub and soap. These turned out nicely. Smells of baking crescent cakes emanated from the kitchen. I have more sachets to finish, and then the new line will be done. Absently placing another kiss on Nani's head, Shanti forced her focus into the here and now, the mundane and real before her. The shop was her joy. Colorful arrangements of crystals and herbs were laid out on tables. Books of arcane knowledge lined the shelves, mixed with fiction of the more witchy persuasion for her customers that liked a little less serious way to pass the time. Comfy couches, an herbal section, and handmade articles tailored to each customer all made the shop a destination location. Shanti was proud of it all. A talented baker and a whiz with a computer, Bria made the cakes and cookies they sold at a profit. She and Bria did readings in tarot, runes, and occasionally Shanti threw the bones. The boudoir photo studio at the back of the shop brought in a tidy sum. So did the paranormal photography when she could line up a sighting. Three separate websites with Bria in charge of them all. Some days Shanti wondered what she would ever do without the girl. Local artists brought her goddess art, and she sold it on consignment. She'd even bought a few outright. Her apartment upstairs allowed her to keep the wards in line where she needed to, run the shop, and deal with the unexpected paranormal nonsense when it arose. This place was a haven for those in need. The full moon was coming, and the women who looked to her for guidance would gather for the mother's blessing. She was Shanti of all trades, really, an all-around, all-purpose witch. Hello, Earth to Shanti. Bria cocked her head, waving her hand to get Shanti's attention. Sorry, Shanti blinked. My mind keeps drifting elsewhere this evening. Shanti glanced again out the French door glass. Nani whined a little, low and plaintive. I just asked if you had another appointment. Bria placed the soap and salt scrub in the basket on the counter. Her long blonde hair was piled on her head in a loose mop, makeup tastefully done. Bria's form-fitting t-shirt read, My other car is a broom. It showed off her curves, hugging her tiny hips encased in low-rise jeans. Pink and white sneakers with sparkling laces completed the outfit. You've been baking. It smells wonderful. Shanti set Nani down and his nails clicked across the wooden floor. I have a reading in a few minutes. Shanti watched Nani waddle down the hall a moment, then turned to Bria. Have you noticed anything unusual tonight? Not really, no. Bria met her gaze quizzically as she moved back toward the kitchen. Follow me? I don't want to burn this last batch. That would be a sin indeed. They went to the kitchen and Shanti paused at the cooling rack. She took a bite of one of the cooled crescent cakes dusted with powdered sugar. It melted in her mouth and she sighed appreciatively. The sound of Nani barking erupted from the other room. What is it, little man? Shanti poked her head back into the hallway, found Nani growling low and menacing at the French doors. Alarm skittered into Shanti's consciousness. That was proof. Something was out there. The front chime jiggled as the door opened. Bria. Shanti's voice was cool, calm, but without room for argument or questions. I'm going to need you to handle the reading. Can you do that for me? It wasn't really a question. Bria was staring at her, comprehending. Of course, Shanti. They left the kitchen together. Dark images pulled at the corner of Shanti's vision. She needed to get to her workspace. Nani, come. Shanti left Bria to the client as she and Nani entered her private garden. Opening her senses, Shanti stepped into the center of the blue-lit pentagram and pushed at the enclosed space with her mind. Nothing. No. Something. Had been there. But it was gone now. A feeling of dread she hadn't felt since Eddie was taken twisted inside her. She thrust the thought away violently. Revisiting that time was not helpful. Nani stared off into the shadows and gave a low whine. I know, boy. We have work to do, little love. 
Bells jingled as her sandals padded against the flagstone path to her workshed. Waving her fingers over the lock, it disengaged. What had once been a small building filled with gardening tools had been converted into her private stock of spell essentials for magic. Nani followed her inside, his nails clicking on the wood floor, crossing over the inlaid pentagram that made the space sacred. Bookcases lined the walls, filled with bottles of herbs, compounds, brews, and potions. Each one was labeled and arranged by correspondences so she could find anything quickly in an emergency. An altar to the goddess rested in the western corner of the room. A stone figure with upright arms joined together over her head, full breast and a long tapered body etched with spirals was the centerpiece. Shells, a bowl of purified water, a willow branch, pearls, aquamarine stones, and three gold coins were scattered over a cloth of blue and silver. In front of the altar was her spellwork table with a busy counter just behind it. Everything was within reach. She needed that when the visions became so real she wasn't sure if she was here on the physical plane or somewhere else entirely. Shanti sat down in the wooden chair, Nani settling into the round dog bed beside her feet. Shanti closed her eyes, breathed in, breathed out, and dark visions came. Images swirled and pulsed behind her lids. Guided by the divine, her hands began to move of their own accord. Protection. She needed to strengthen the wards. The urgency of the need reverberated through her body. Hurry. Create. There was something else. Somewhere else. Best to make a large batch. A small cauldron rested on the portable hot plate on the counter behind her. After a particularly bad episode of Visions where an open flame had nearly caught her robes on fire, she had switched to the safer convenience. It wasn't showy, but it worked. Basil, black pepper, some salt water, flax and the essence of rowan, an iron nail to ward against Fay. To this, she added vervain and a sprinkling of ash. Goddess divine, hear my plea. Heighten wards, protection be. In this place of sacred spells, build the walls where weakness dwells. Salt and ash, iron and seed, bring strength to those who come in need. This would be dirty magic at best, but the cloudy pictures in her mind's eye were not clear. Something was coming. Shanti didn't know what, but this witch wasn't going to sit still waiting. Nani yawned, his pink puppy tongue curling as he stretched. Yes, little man, we must prepare. She reached down and scratched his head, earning her a snort. The chimes outside in the garden began to tinkle and clank together. Yes, indeed. Reaching behind her for a ceremonial dagger, Shanti dipped it into the brew and set it on the windowsill. The full moon would charge it. She would find what was causing the disturbance and root it out. <laughs>